Thank you, thank you. Uh, really appreciate the welcome. Um, no, this isn't a rap video. Um, a lot of the students that I teach at Cal State San Marcos, Cal State Long Beach, um, and other institutions have actually labeled me a rapper. I'm not. I'm a homie. I call myself a homie uh, in my barrio, in my community. Uh, that's gender neutral talk, right? Um, Cubo, which means hello in my community. So today I'm going to talk about, uh, not about my dissertation, but more about uh, the global apartheid or global apartheid system that we're looking at uh, on a global scale. I mean, we all know what's happening in uh, uh, Palestine, Israel right now, right? Um, I just actually saw a demonstration which uh, warmed my heart, right? Um, so what I'm going to talk about is how there's these mechanisms of social control and how they're all linked to global capitalism. A lot of the time, your experiences are actually separated from the larger structure of globalization, global capitalism, which I guess I understand now why they brought me here to talk about that link from micro, your experiences, to the ma uh, macro level. Uh, as growing up, I never thought about my experiences being linked to corporations, being linked to globalization, being linked to global capitalism at all. I was a young homeboy just thinking of my own life experiences. Like, well, I chose to be in a gang. I chose to get incarcerated. I chose to uh, get my education, right? But I never thought it was a link or the structural link within global capitalism. So my, the title of my uh, presentation is uh, Global Apartheid System. Global Capitalism, Incarceration, and the Spatial Social Control of Poor Barrios. I use barrios to pay homage to my community. A lot of times, our own lived experiences is guiding our education, which is what I'm trying to do with my education. I want to put that voice from the barrio, from incarceration, from gangs, from policing, from marginalization at the forefront of these institutions, right? Um, anybody know where this is at? What's up? El Salvador? El Salvador? Good job. 10 extra credit points, please. <laughs> it's the new supermax prison in El Salvador. And what does this have to do with globalization or global capitalism? Well, how this prison was built was created by a moral panic. There's a problem in El Salvador. There's a gang problem in El Salvador. Gangs are taking over our communities. Sound familiar? What happened in the 1960s, 1970s? These civil rights movements, they're all vigilantes. We need to control these groups. Which for me is when the system of hyper-incarceration happened. Uh, I don't use mass incarceration because that entails all of you have an equal chance of getting incarcerated. Hyper-incarceration basically says that a certain group of population is targeted to be incarceration. People that look like me, people of color, black, brown communities, and the poor white communities. Let's not forget that. So this is in El Salvador. And you know that there's massive corporations invested in this, from the food, the clothing, to the militarized police guarding this institution. So we can't divorce our lived experiences from the larger structure of global capitalism. See, when I was growing up, I didn't understand that. I do not understand that how people see me is part of this larger structure to create profit, right? So again, me growing up, I always ask my students, how do you define a criminal? The first thing that pops into your mind, how do you define a criminal? Anybody, just shout it out. Someone breaks the law. Breaks the law? What about phenotypically? You're not going to offend me. You say, someone that looks like you, professor? You're not going to offend me, because I've been labeled that the whole, my whole life. I actually shared a story with uh, Professor Philip and some grad students up there that even as a professor, me inviting people that have been marginalized, that have been formerly incarcerated, still labels me and still follows me that system of policing. Right? I was stopped by CSU police saying, like, hey, what are these folks doing here? They don't belong here. I'm like, what, what do you mean you, we don't belong here? We have the same opportunity. We have the trying to succeed. We're trying to push for a systemic change, and yet you still says that we're not good enough to be in your institution. That's what policing is, right? So we can't divorce that from the larger structure of global capitalism. 
right? So my dissertation is focused on this many-headed hydra, uh, right? Um, gentrification, policing, militarism, uh, houseless persons, right? Gang injunctions, immigration. Does anybody know what a gang injunction is before I move on? No. Well, it's because Irvine doesn't have any. A gang injunction is basically a civil lawsuit against a certain group of individuals, particularly gangs. In the area I study, it was a, there was two gang injunctions in Escondido, which is a city in uh, North County, San Diego, right? Two gang injunctions in this area. Vista has one. So all these cities are areas where they have gang injunctions. Gang injunctions are actually uh, what they call the right hand of the capitalist system because they benefit off of policing and picking people into the prison system. So for the purpose of this presentation, I will not just go through all these because that was my whole dissertation. Uh, I'm going to focus more on uh, immigration, but all these, if you want to read my dissertation, it's fairly long, <laughs> um, shows how all these are entangled. And you can't see one without the other. You can't see gentrification without gang injunctions because where there's gentrification, there's a gang injunction implemented or a gang injunction put in place in order to displace that community, in order to make that community sexy, you know. Welcome, welcome, middle class folk. Start your businesses here. Start capital, praise capitalism, right? So that, again, going back, uh, these are the theories that I use. Uh, for my dissertation, I used uh, this one right here, the global police state. Um, but I use theories of global capitalism and globalization, right? Um, Dr. Robinson talks about epical shifts, which I will discuss in a little bit. Um, but these are basically the three books that are my theoretical perspective or my theoretical framework for my dissertation. Uh, a theory of global capitalism, which I show that dif there's different epochs of globalization, which I will discuss in a little bit. Uh, the Golden Gulag. Uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore has become one of the uh, top prison abolition advocates uh, in the past 10 years. And then, of course, Dr. Robinson's The Global Police State. So here's Dr. Robinson's theory, right? Globalization or global capitalism has four epochal shifts. The first one is more capitalism or permanent accumulation, which was basically the conquest of the Americas, especially here in the United States. We can go back to uh, the colonization of Africa, but at least here in the United States, it was that infamous date. Was it 1492? Right? That was mercantilism, murder, genocide, new waves of expansion. The second wave was competitive capitalism, people competing for the capitalist system. Right? It was highlighted by the Industrial Revolution. Right? More production, more production. Right? A more production system. Third, that become of monopoly capitalism. Right? This is where the emergence of transnational corporations or corporations started to become visible. Right? And then finally, globalization, which according to, Cap uh, according, to Cap according to Dr. Robinson, it began in the area of 1960s, 1970s, when the capitalism actually expanded. So instead of having national corporations in the Americas, McDonald's went to China, Africa, Central America, Latin America, in order to expand profits. But there's actually two, two things happening here. Capitalism is going global, why? Because of the massive instability of the globe. You have massive movements happening there, especially in the United States. Civil rights movement, anti-war movement, War movement, the women's liberation movement. In Mexico, you have the massacre of Tatelorco. And if you don't know the massacre of Tatelorco, I suggest that you um, look it up because there's massive movements everywhere, not just in the United States, Mexico, all over the world, Central America, revolutions popping up everywhere. So, this is how we see capitalists, a transnational capitalist today. Right? It's a piece of monopoly capitalism, but only few corporations owning 
Um, and each year, there's a big, big convention in Davos where these corporations, the CEOs, their agents, uh, people that follow these capitalists, go and say, well, how are we going to govern the next few years? Today's, uh, 2023's um, meeting was about climate and climate change, right? But not saying like, oh, how are we going to contribute to changing the climate? No. How can we buy more shares so we can continue polluting the system, right? So that's, again, monopoly capital. So I want to focus here on the era of globalization, right? Um, there's massive movements in the 1970s. Again, going back to uh, the Black Panther Party, right, which Edgar Hoover deemed the biggest threat to American democracy in the world. You have the Chicanx, Latinx liberation movement, or civil rights movement, right? You have the anti-war movement. So you have these massive movements, massive upheavals, right? And it's all tied to the economic and class system. There was actually massive unemployment during this era, right? So the world was in crisis. And what does the transnational capitalist class do? Well, one is, oh, before I go into uh, Antonio Gramsci's, there's unprecedented inequality all across the world because of global capitalism. I think last statistics I've read, which were uh, in 2019, show that 1% of humanity owns more than 50% of the world's wealth, 20% owns about 95%, and 80%, which is most of us, because we don't own McDonald's, we don't own, well, maybe some of y'all do, but don't hate me, talking shit about you. Um, but 80% uh, of humanity owns only 5% of the world's wealth, right? These are unprecedented inequalities. Unprecedented. We've never seen inequalities like this before. There's a reason why in Las Vegas, I actually just saw a video in Las Vegas, right? There's a massive protest. <laughs> Sorry. There's a massive protest, right? People in the film industry, the writers, are going on protest. Uh, just last year, UC students, especially uh, TAs, RAs, went on strike because everything's gone so expensive because of stagnation. That's crisis, right? That's what I study. And I study how these crises lead to more mechanisms of social control, right? So because of these crises, there's a rise in what some sociologists call surplus population. Um, I call it surplus humanity, right? Precarious labor, right? People that are on the verge of losing their job, or people that are barely making ends meet. And that's about 3.6 billion people all over the world. They're part of what they call surplus humanity, right? So now, going back to Antonio Gramsci, uh, which was a, a prison in prison uh, during uh, Mussolini's dictatorship, he came out with this term of coercion and consent, or hegemony, right? If you're trying to challenge the hegemonic power, you're going to have coercion domination. Homelessness, immigration, right? Immigration laws, policies that criminalize immigrants, hyperincarceration, right? But there's also consensual, which I will not highlight here. I do have a paper coming out that talks about consensual domination and how ideologically some folks are part of the system and become part of the system, right? Um, but I won't highlight it here. I'm, I'm going to focus on the coercive part of um, his former domination, right? So super incarceration or hyper incarceration is part of this coercive system of domination. You don't want to abide by the capitalist system. You don't want to abide by the technical. You want to ideologically look at my, like me and challenge the system. We're going to police you, criminalize you, and incarcerate you. Same thing that's happening in El Salvador, going back to the image in front, right? Um, Stephen Osuna has a beautiful article written on that moral panic of La Mara Salvatrucha. Mara Salvatrucha is the gang that's being affected by the policies and punitive policies in El Salvador, incarcerating 40,000 people, and not just gang members, activists, children. So um, the moral panic of El Salvador is written by Stephen Osuna, if you want to write that one down. But 
Again, Antonio Gramsci talks about this coercion side of domination. When you have so many people, part of surplus population, part of surplus humanity, they are a potential threat to the system, right? They can bring revolution, they can bring revolt. So what do you do with this group? Well, again, you criminalize it and incarcerate it, right? So how do you control surplus humanity? Through what Robinson calls the global police state. And again, this is the second part of uh, my theory, theory and theoretical framework. And these are basically the aspects of the global police state, right? An ever more omnipresent system of mass social control, repression, and warfare promoted by the ruling groups to contain an actual and potential rebellion of the global working class or surplus humanity. Two, how global economy itself is based more and more on the development and deployment of these systems of warfare, social control, and repression, simply as a means of making profit, continuing accumulation in capital, and in the face of stagnation. Dr. Robinson labels this militarized accumulation or accumulation by repression. And then finally, the increased move towards political systems of 21st century fascism, which is Bukele's regime right now. Um, I'm not gonna focus on the last one. I'm gonna focus on the first two, uh, just for the purposes of this presentation. Um, how the system benefits off of the incarceration of surplus humanity. So then we go to the meso level. Right? We saw the macro level, the theoretical framework, how globalization works, how there's a transnational capitalist class, how the globalization, that global capitalism works to basically create the conditions of surplus humanity. Right? So the meso level or the institutional level is where, how do you deal with this group? So basically you lock up surplus humanity or populations that are a potential threat to the system. Uh, there's an intersectional dimension to this. Of course, there's higher rates of black and brown uh, communities incarcerated uh, when it's compared to their population, right? Gendered aspect, right? Women constitute now one of the highest rate of incarceration, even higher than men today. And to push it even further, global capitalism depends on this labor, on the differentiation to massively exploit women Right? The example that comes to my mind is the maquiladoras in the US-Mexico border, where the dominant maquiladoras are basically huge sweatshops, probably as big as a university, owned by transnational capitalist corporations. And the majority of the labor done in these huge sweatshops is women. Right? And the immigration aspect of it. Why is it that people migrate from Mexico, Central America, uh, Latin America? Because exactly this, there's massive exploitation in these countries, right? People always have that idea, oh, why don't they fix their own country? Well, they can because transnational corporations have come in and basically don't abide by any of the laws and massively exploit the community. So instead of winning, I think the minimum wage right now is 15.50. You go overseas, fuck, I'll pay 250 right? And what's problematic with this is that now transnational corporations are going overseas, so let's say there's a Home Depot in Mexico now, the same prices you pay for lumber or anything that you need to improve your house here is happening in Mexico. So if you can't afford anything at 50 how are you gonna afford something at 250 People start migrating because of that, forced migration. So I'm gonna focus on that migration. Um, a good uh, YouTube video or YouTube documentary that I highly recommend is uh, Banana Land, Blood, Bullets, and Poison. Shows, again, that connection of global corporations going into, I think it's uh, Ecuador uh, and Colombia, right? Massively exploiting the community, having death squads kill anyone that resists. Again, that's part of the coercion domination, right? and then pushing community people out. Um, again, in this globalization epoch, we have massive caravans. Why do you think there's massive caravans? 
People don't just choose to leave their livelihood. They don't they just choose to leave home. Think about it. How did you feel when you left your home to come study here at UCI? Nobody wants to leave their livelihood. But things have gone so bad with poverty, hunger, paramilitary movements. A lot of these paramilitary groups are trained here in the School of the Americas. Uh, they changed the name because, again, School of the Americas, again, became too controversial. But even if you look up School of the Americas, you'll see um, a lot of sociologists call it School of the uh, Assassins. Because a lot of people are trained at the School of the Americas and are sent to different countries in order for them to train their own paramilitary groups for the interest of capital and global corporations. So again, capitalism and the militarization of the Americas. Uh, there's exploited and super exploited controlled labor in the Americas, which I will go over in a little bit. But we become a system of well, we're a wild war, right? There's a reason why Trump and Biden continues to build a wall. Not to keep immigrants out, not to keep what they call illegal drugs out. By the way, there's a drug war capitalism. I highly recommend that book. Shows a link between why is it that the US doesn't want to stop the war on drugs? Because it's fairly profitable. But that's a different story. We become a wild world. Right? So Trump, Biden, you name the president. They don't want to build a wall to keep people out. They want to control the labor. They want to control who comes in. That's why my presentation is called Systems of Social Control in the virus. So there's 63 walls have been built since the 1980s. Again, to control immigration flow. Uh, and then, which is something that's fairly interesting, that's part of my next project, is that um, there's a high influence now on high tech or technology or digitalization in order to continue that social control of communities. So I keep going like this, but it's because that, that doesn't, <laughs> my little clicker doesn't work. So when we look at transnational migration and the link to global capitalism or capitalist globalization, sorry if I step in, by the way, um, it has three purposes. How do you link it to global capital and globalization? Well, free trade agreements like NAFTA, CAFTA, the North America Free Trade Agreement, or Central America Free Trade Agreement, displace millions of people throughout the globe. Right? Number two, immigrants arrive in the United States and they're super exploited. They work for the lowest wages. Right? And two, they're super controlled by the police state, immigration rates. La Migra, right? There, uh, if you go on the five all the way down to San Diego, you're bound to find a border patrol. Guaranteed. And they're part of the system of super incarceration. So we, again, we can't see these systems as separate from one another, but as part of the whole totality or the whole system of global capitalism. So that's a concentration, I call it a concentration camp that Biden built when he first went in office. I actually had other pictures of him continuing building the wall in uh, the Mexico-US border, right? And these, again, are images of people in cages. Some people don't even keep their dogs in these conditions or their pets. Yet, this is normalized, right? Um, and So we become a transnational migrant world. This is just an image of uh, Castell's, um, what he calls South-South migration. It's no longer just uh, South-North migration, but South-South. So a lot of people, to use uh, Saskia Assassin's work, are moving to global cities, meaning where there's major uh, opportunity for capital gain. So a lot of people are not moving to the countryside where there's massive lands. They're moving to cities like Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, Detroit, these major global cities, Mexico City, Buenos Aires in Argentina, Tokyo in Japan, right? So 
So transnational migrants in the United States. They're part of what they call this segmented labor, right? Um, and what we mean by segmented labor, I'm, I'm gonna push back to 1960, 1970s. You had these massive civil rights movements, social movements, right? The black and brown communities in this era were massively exploited, super controlled, yet they lifted their rose in civil rights movement. So now you need another labor force. And this is where citizenship and non-citizenship plays an important role, right? So we can massively exploit people that are non-citizens now, right? Why? Well, if you don't want to work for these low wages, I can call ice on you. I can easily deport you because of that citizenship and non-citizenship. Don't get me wrong, that other system of social control, which is criminalization policing in the inner cities, right, it's still happening. But now you have a different labor force coming in to massively exploit. Again, if the immigrant labor was gone, let's just say tomorrow immigrant labor was gone, uh, the economy would collapse. Immigrants do push a lot of uh, this global economy. And not just in the United States, globally. So that's what we mean by segmented labor, right? Different forms of segmented labor. Citizenship, non-citizenship, right? Um, and it's all tied to racialized communities. So there are new global hierarchies, going back to citizenship and non-citizenship. Who's more worthy to get a job? Trump's election in 2016, he banked on that. Make America great again. The white community was experiencing downward mobility, right? While sectors of other groups were experiencing upward mobility. So that's how, for me and a lot of uh, other sociologists, that's how Trump got elected. Um, but they're still part of this super exploited racist capitalist system, right? And we see, see some conditions. Um, these are, again, sweatshops in LA. If you drive to Los Angeles and there's buildings and buildings with boards on them, um, they're pretty much sweatshops. Um, there's a, a cool film on YouTube called Made in LA. It talks about the exploitation process of Forever 21. I usually ask my students, who shops at Forever 21? But I'm not going to say that. That's a, that's a young stores. Um, in the field, the migrants are forced to work. I was part of the movement in Oxnard when the fires were going on in Santa Barbara. Migrants were still forced to work in those conditions. And the construction, All right? Segmented labor. So there's a war against immigrants that started because of, uh, it started way before 2001, but it actually exacerbated into the 2001 when the um, Twin Towers uh, got demolished or got destroyed. Um, so 2001, there's been a heightened uh, criminalization of immigration or immigrants, right? Immigrants are extremely profitable to global capitalists. Immigrants' labor is super exploitable and super controlled, like we talked about, right, in different fields. But the criminalization of immigrants benefits these corporations. Core Civic, GEO, two of the biggest private corporations benefit off of the criminalization of immigrants. Laws and policies that are passed, right? The zero tolerance policy passed by Trump, right? That guarantees a steady supply of immigrants in immigration detention centers, right? And again, going back, major corporations benefit off of these immigration detention centers. AT&T, McDonald's, Starbucks, military companies, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, all are major investors in prisons. Which is why I always push my students to think the macro level is not separated from the meso and micro level analysis is not separated from the criminalization of people in my community because the system benefits off of it, right? So criminalization or this new system of criminalization that a lot of sociologists and political sciences and a lot of academics are talking about, this new system of criminalization, right? It's part of the immigration industrial complex, right? Undocumented immigrants are the fastest growing population in the U.S. prison system. And not just the U.S. prison system, but the U.S. private prison system.
So modes of resistance, where there's massive exploitation, where there's expo uh, massive suffrage, um, there's also resistance. So my study looked at Union del Barrio, which was based on Los Angeles and San Diego, right? Um, they fight against policing. They actually have a prison project brewing uh, in San Diego. Um, so they bring speakers from different communities, to, uh, formerly incarcerated individuals, to come speak. So I did my research with them, and then I did my, uh, my research in the community of San Diego as a whole. Um, so I did Zoom interviews, semi-structured and informal interviews with people in the community, um, immigrants, gang members. So for my project, I tried to tie all these issues together. My professor's like, that's a big project. And I was like, yeah, I need to liberate my community. Don't matter the cost. So I did field research, participant observation, and finally, I looked at existing data. So I looked at um, stock markets like today, right now, these past five days, all these major uh, corporations that are invested in the military, that are invested in war, their stocks went up. Why is that? Yeah. Israel Palestine. Israel Palestine. The past five days, their stocks shot way up. And you see, that has to do with the suffrage and murder of people in Israel and Palestine. Uh, so this is one of the sites that I looked at. This is where, uh, it's, it's called the Gang Injunction. Um, and this was made, the, the darker side was made in 2007. The larger side is made in, was uh, actually put in place in 2010. Um, but this area is where massive policing, massive criminalization, homeless folk are here. Right? And there's massive gentrification happening. There's new condos being built right along this area where here is called Center City. So in this area where it's Escondido Boulevard, all throughout here, new condos have been built since 2007, 2010. Of course, they, what I call, they pimpify the community, make it look nice, make it look beautiful, right? Raise the prices. Of course, people that can't afford rent have to move out. So they move out to neighboring cities. And it's pushed for uh, the moving of middle class individuals. Um, and they're not just white folk. It's members from all walks of life, all paths of life. White, black, brown, Asian, you name it. Here's another one, another gang energy, another uh, barrio I looked at. San, uh, this is San Marcos. Uh, it's ironic that the, the San Marcos school is actually right, so this is the area. San Marcos school is right here. And right here, there's the now back state cows now. There's, um, right here at San Marcos Boulevard, there's new condos, mom and pop stores that are f super expensive, right? And then there's Vista. New theater was built in Vista at the expense of pushing out community members, right? And one of the reasons I'm not a Dodger fan, I saw, I see a couple of Dodger jerseys, don't hate me, but a lot of times the Dodgers are called displacers. Why? They tore down the uh, Chicanx and Latinx community of where they built Dodger Stadium. Forcefully moved families. Linking it to capital to generate capital for the Dodgers. See, we can't divorce what's happening in the micro level as of what's happening on the global scale. Always think about that. I actually mentioned this to my professor. He's like, now that you've mentioned global capitalism all the time, now I think of everything as global capitalism. But hopefully, that's what you get out of this class, that everything's linked to global capitalism. That's the major point. Union del Barrio. Uh, so they actually were uh, kind enough to give me a map of uh, basically immigration rates uh, and immigration uh, checkpoints that happened throughout um, Escondido. Remember this area? That's where gang injunctions is at. This area is where the uh, Diablo's gang injunction is at, or the Escondido gang injunction, and then this is where the West Side gang injunction is at. You see around it? No policing, no border patrol, 
Nada. Nothing. Sorry. If I say something in Spanish, tell me, to, hey, fool, can you translate? I talk Spanish and English at my household, so uh, just letting y'all know. So the, um, again, where there's massive suppression, there's always counter resistance. So they've developed ways to what they call patrullajes comunitarios or community policing in order for them to say, hey, there's immigration here, there's an undercover here, right? Um, and finally, um, just to wrap up my uh, presentation, uh, and I'm gonna show a quick little video at the end, um, I'm focusing on this, the new wave of social control, led by the fourth industrial revolution, which is called digitalization. Let me see if I could play the clip real quick. It's up like about a two, three minute clip. And then I'll open it up for questions. Your kids probably have one of these, right? Not quite. Hell of a pilot? No. That skill is all AI. It's flying itself. Its processor can react a hundred times faster than a human. The stochastic motion is an anti-sniper feature. Just like any mobile device these days, it has cameras and sensors, and just like your phones and social media apps, it does facial recognition. Inside here is three grams of shaped explosive. This is how it works. Did you see that? That little bang is enough to penetrate the skull and destroy the contents. Now trust me, these were all bad guys. Now that is an airstrike of surgical precision. It's one of a range of products. Trained as a team, they can penetrate buildings, cars, trains, evade people, bullets, pretty much any countermeasure. They cannot be stopped. Now, I said this was big. Why? Because we are thinking big. Watch. A $25 million order now buys this. Enough to kill half a city. The bad half. Nuclear is obsolete. Take out your entire enemy, virtually risk-free. Just characterize him, release the swarm, and rest easy. This short film is more than just speculation. It shows the results of integrating and miniaturizing technologies that we already have. I'm Stuart Russell, a professor of computer science at Berkeley. I've worked in AI for more than 35 years. Its potential to benefit humanity is enormous, even in defense. But allowing machines to choose to kill humans will be devastating to our security and freedom. Thousands of my fellow researchers agree. We have an opportunity to prevent the future you just saw, but the window to act is closing fast. Dun, dun. That's the future of warfare and this war economy that we live in. Um, my name is Oscar So. Thank you for listening.
Love y'all, fam.